Good evening and welcome to tonight's JDRF No Limit Speaker Series event. My name is Kristen Janke and I'm the Director of Community Engagement at JDRF. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight marks our third event in our No Limit Speaker Series. We launched this new program earlier this year and we're excited to bring you a new topic each quarter. Tonight is all about nutrition, which we know is always a popular topic. We're delighted to welcome our featured speaker, Catherine McManus, who is joining us from Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. You'll also hear from one of our amazing JDRF outreach volunteers, Danielle Steppett, who serves as a friendly and knowledgeable resource to newly diagnosed families in JDRF's New Jersey Metro and Rockland County chapter. If you are joining us tonight, it means you or a loved one were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes within the last year. On behalf of JDRF, I'd like to welcome you to our T1D family. You were likely introduced to JDRF through one of our resources like the Bag of Hope for Children or our No Limits Care Kits for Teens and Adults. We hope you found these resources to be educational and inspirational as you begin your new journey with type 1 diabetes. We created this No Limit series to continue to provide education and also connection within the T1D community throughout your first year of diagnosis. We know receiving a T1D diagnosis can often be overwhelming, and we understand there's a lot to learn, especially throughout your first year. I was in a similar place to many of you nine years ago when my then six-year-old son, Max, was diagnosed with T1D. I remember feeling all sorts of emotions as a parent and at times feeling overwhelmed with learning how to manage this for my child. Counting carbs correctly, closely reading nutrition labels was entirely new for me. Understanding how different foods affected Max's blood sugar in different ways, that was confusing. And then there's how to manage food and exercise, which can feel quite complex. But tonight, Catherine will clear up the confusion and answer all those questions and more. She's going to talk about the important relationship between food and nutrition and how these tools can help you manage your T1D. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. We will have time at the end of Catherine's presentation for Q&A. If you have a question for Catherine, please use the Q&A feature to submit your question. You'll see the icon at the bottom of your screen. Your question will be sent directly to Catherine and we will address it at the end of the program. We are recording this presentation. We have implemented several security protocols provided by Zoom to avoid any inappropriate interruptions by unknown third parties, otherwise known as Zoom bombers. If we do encounter any interruptions during the program, we will work immediately to remove these individuals and resolve the issue. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to first introduce Danielle Steppett to share a bit about her family's journey with T1D. Danielle? Thank you, Kristen. Hi everyone. Um, I am going to quickly share a presentation I made. Um, just quickly giving you some uh, background about myself. Um, give it a second to load. If it loads, okay. So I'm a married mom of a 16 year old son, Christopher, and an 11 year old daughter, Tara. I'm also an elementary special education teacher. Now you may be wondering why I'm here. I am also a T1D mom of a T1D rock star. Um, I'm from New Jersey, like Kristen said, um, I'm in the Jersey Shore, central New Jersey. Um, and I'm part of the JDRF, New Jersey Metro and Rockland County chapter as both a parent of a child with T1D and also a volunteer. So I've been an outreach volunteer for about four years and I've been the JDRF T1D Connections program partner for about three years. I'll fill you in a little bit about that later on. So my connection to T1D, on July 19th, 2015, my son Christopher was diagnosed with type one diabetes at the age of 10. And you can see in the first picture that was him on diagnosis day. Even though he's still in the hospital, he's always been a smiley kid and nothing changed that day. Um, and we actually just celebrated his sixth anniversary. He's 16 now. Um, he's doing really well. He's a junior in high school. Um, and this is him on July 20th, 2021 at his sixth anniversary fundraiser. Now a anniversary, um, it's not something that everyone chooses to do, we choose to celebrate in our family. Um, it's a personal choice for each and every 
person, but our family uses this day to celebrate um, Chris living his best life despite uh, having type one and celebrating that he's done it for another year. Um, when Chris was diagnosed, we asked him uh, at the age of 10 if he wanted to keep his um, diagnosis only and share it with only the people who needed to know or if he wanted to use what happened to him to help other people um, in a similar situation. And without hesitation, he looked at us with his little 10 year old face and said, I wanna use it to help other people. So this will segue into how we became involved in um, JDRF. So before we even left the hospital, after hearing him saying that he wanted to help other people, I started researching and finding out what uh, there was out there for type one diabetes. And I just kept stumbling upon JDRF. So from that situation in the hospital before we left, uh, we were signed up for our first um, one walk. And we actually have done the one walk for the past seven years. The past two years have been virtual, um, but we have walked every single year. So in these pictures, you can see Chris with me, his proud mom. Um, the second picture is in one of our walks with him as a V1P. And the last picture is Chris, uh, a picture of Chris sharing. He did a TED talk in his middle school sharing his story and he entitled it From Diagnosis to Action, uh, talking about how his life has changed from when he was diagnosed to what he's done currently to help him uh, help other people. So our family's first experience with JDRF was our local chapter's annual one walk at the Jersey Shore just three months after Chris's diagnosis. It was such an amazing day in which we were able to see firsthand the T1D community that exists and deals with the same exact things that our T1D family deals with each and every day. And we knew that day that we wanted to do anything we could to help other people like the people who were at that walk um, and the community that was around us served for us. So you can see the first picture, that was our first walk in 2015. And the last, the second picture is our last in-person walk um, in October of 2009, pre-pandemic. Uh, the most helpful resources for our family during the first year of diagnosis was obviously the JDRF One Walk. Um, the JDRF Bag of Hope, which hopefully some of you got, um, you either filled out a form or you got it right in the hospital um, that is filled with tons of useless, useful information, including our wonderful Rufus, which was helpful even for my 10 year old. And most importantly, the community that JDRF created for us of other type one families. And currently we still do the one walk every, every year. Um, we try to attend the type one nation summit my son is also a youth ambassador with the youth ambassador program, which I can attribute to him being able to find his voice and being able to advocate for himself and share uh, his type one diagnosis with other people um, and the support groups that the chapters of JDRF uh, provide. Um, we've never done the toddler or school age since my son was diagnosed after, but we have done the tween and teen groups and hopefully he will transition into the adult group as well. Um, and the parents of children with T1D. Uh, we've made friends, other friends within the type one community that we without question consider family. Um, and it was something that we never expected, but it is something that we all understand. Um, and we know what it's like to live with each and every day where sometimes this disease can be um, isolating. But when you find other people who just get it, um, it makes it, so much more positive and such an impact. Now to go about the connections program, um, the JDRF T1D connections program matches newly diagnosed individuals and families with others who have lived with C1D for years. JDRF volunteers are the voice of experience and hope for those facing the challenge of learning to manage their T1D or those transitioning to a new life stage with T1D. JDRF outreach volunteers have a personal connection to T1D. There are caregivers, spouses, and other adults who either have T1D themselves or have a loved one affected by the disease. All of our volunteers understand how overwhelming it can be to adapt to the daily demands of managing T1D. And they are here to help you through it. 
Now, if you already have a connections, that's amazing. Um, if not, Kristen is going to share in the chat a link for you to be able to click to sign up for a connections partner, a volunteer. Um, the volunteers are usually within your chapter um, and they're try, we try to pair you based on either geographic location or age based on um, similar ages of the children. If it's um, a family or if you're an adult, they'll pair you with another adult basically trying to connect you with someone who will just get it and understand where you are in your life stage. Um, and this program goes for a year, although a lot of the time uh, after that year is over, the connections stay and um, we wind up staying in contact with a lot of the people that we were initially paired with and connected with. So, if you have any questions about the Connections program, like I said, Kristen is going to post the link in the chat um, and it'll be shared directly to your local chapter of JDRF. Um, so reach out to your local connect, your local chapter and they can connect you with the outreach person in your chapter and get you set up with that. Right now, I'm so pleased to introduce our featured speaker, Catherine McManus. Catherine is a licensed registered dietitian and assistant professor and director of nutrition curriculum and education at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Catherine's expertise focuses on type 1 diabetes and culinary and lifestyle medicine. She also currently serves as the vice chair of the type 1 diabetes expert panel for the Academy of Nutrition and Diet Dietitians. Catherine is a great friend to JDRF, and we're so thrilled to have her joining us tonight to share her expertise on the important role food and nutrition serve in T1D management. Catherine, I'm pleased to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that kind introduction. I truly appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm really excited and honored to be here, um, probably primarily because like so many of you, I also have type 1 diabetes, and I've also been plugging along this crazy type 1 journey for over 26 years now. So any opportunity I have to talk with others about kind of the challenges, the struggles and possible ways that we can overcome them, I am more than happy to do so. So tonight what we're gonna be doing is talking really about the role of food and nutrition in not only helping us better manage our type one diabetes, but also just honestly improving our overall health and well being. So we are gonna start off just broadly talking about the role that food and nutrition plays in helping us better manage our type one diabetes. So when I say managing type one diabetes, I'm guessing probably the first thing that pops to your mind is managing your blood glucose levels, right? Managing your blood sugars. And as so many of you know, this is certainly not an easy task to do. And the reason being, if you think about all the different things that affect and impact your blood sugars, it probably seems like just about everything, right? From exercise to growth and development, illness, changes in weight status, any and every type of stress will affect your blood sugar, seasonal changes, sleep patterns, as well as other types of medications. So we can see that so many things affect our blood sugar, which makes it so, so challenging to manage within that desired range. But probably one of the most obvious things missing from this list are foods and beverages, right? Because we know that foods and beverages can certainly have a significant and dramatic impact on our blood sugar levels, depending on the type. And the reason that I say depending on the type is because foods and beverages can contain any combination of three macronutrients. So macronutrients are nutrients that are found in large quantities. And we have three macronutrients that are found in foods. We have carbohydrates, 
commonly called carbs, fats, as well as protein. And of these three macronutrients, carbs are gonna be the ones that have the biggest and most direct impact on our blood sugar levels, which is why as individuals with type one diabetes, it is so, so, so important for us to continuously count and monitor our intake of carbohydrates. So with our overall goal of type one diabetes to be really keeping our blood sugars within this kind of defined blood glucose range, it is our goal to try to find this balance between our intake of carbohydrates and our insulin. And the reason being is that carbohydrates are really important for our dietary intake. And we'll talk about why in just a little bit. But even though they're important to consume in our diet, they tend to cause our blood glucose levels to rise. So to keep our blood glucose levels within that desired range, we have to counter this rising blood glucose with insulin dosing. So we can constantly kind of find this balance and teeter that between our carb intake and our insulin dosing. But on occasion, I'm sure many, if not all of you have experienced this, there are times when we may either consume too much carbohydrate and or not take enough insulin, which causes our blood sugars to spike and we become hyperglycemic. Or on the flip side, we might take too much insulin and or not eat enough carbs, which causes our blood sugars to drop and we have a low blood sugar and become hypoglycemic. So finding this balance and maintaining this balance can be really, really challenging. So to help us try to find this balance between our carb intake and our insulin dosing, your endocrinologist and kind of your whole clinician team will typically prescribe you a certain insulin regimen. And two of the more commonly used insulin regimens are going to be our fixed daily insulin doses, as well as the second regimen being our insulin to carb ratio. So with our fixed daily insulin doses, what happens with this insulin regimen is a patient or an individual is going to be given a set amount of carbohydrates to consume at every single eating occasion and a set amount of insulin to take simultaneously with that carb intake at every single eating occasion. So it's very consistent trying to maintain that balance between carb intake and insulin dosing. The second insulin regimen is our insulin to carb ratio. So in this, what we actually see is an individual is going to change how much insulin they're actually taking at every eating occasion based on how many carbohydrates they're consuming. So with an insulin to carb ratio, your endocrinologist and your work with your dietitian as well will prescribe you an insulin to carb ratio. So they will say that one unit of insulin needs to be taken for a set number of grams of carbohydrate that you consume. So in our example here, you can see that this patient is prescribed to take one unit of insulin for every 15 grams of carbs that they're consuming. And this ratio will differ within an individual as well as between individuals. So you might be on a 10 to one ratio or a 20 to one ratio. And your endocrinologist will work really, really closely with you to make sure you have that ratio that's gonna work well for you. But regardless of which of these insulin regimens you are on, or even if you're on a different one, you can see that being able to accurately and consistently count carbohydrates is really, really important for managing your type one diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about counting carbs and start off by talking primarily about counting carbs with foods that have food labels. So there are a few really important aspects of that nutrition facts label and with carb counting that we really want to pay attention to. And the first one is going to be the serving size that's listed. So when we're talking about serving size, what we wanna do is compare the serving size that's listed on our nutrition facts label with the actual portion or quantity of food that we're consuming. So this nutrition facts label that's listed here on this slide is for ice cream. So I don't know about any of you guys, but 
there's no way I'm eating just two thirds of a cup of ice cream, right? That's the serving size, but I'm much more likely to probably eat two servings of ice cream. So I'm much more likely to eat about a cup and a third of ice cream. So because when I compare my portion of food I'm eating to the serving size, I'm eating double the quantity. That means therefore I'm taking in twice the amount of nutrients that are listed on that label. So I'd be taking in 460 calories, 16 grams of fat, but most importantly to us with carb counting is that I wouldn't be taking in 37 grams of carbohydrate. Instead, I would be taking in 74 grams. So really, really important to adjust your carb intake based on the portion and the serving size that you're actually consuming. The second really important thing to remember with carb counting is that not all carbs are created equally. And you probably are thinking, what does she mean by that? What I mean is that just because a food is called a carbohydrate, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily, they're all going to have the same exact impact on your blood glucose. So let's talk about two types of carbs as an example of this. We'll talk about dietary fiber and sugar. So dietary fiber is considered a carbohydrate, but it is really, really unique in that the human body is actually not able to digest dietary fiber. So because our body's not actually digesting fiber, even though it's a carbohydrate, it's not going to raise our blood glucose levels. Instead, what it actually does is it slows digestion of other carbohydrates. So it can be really beneficial to consume in our diet because it can prevent these dramatic spikes in our blood glucose levels when we are consuming dietary fiber with other carb sources. So really, really, really what we want to do is when we're choosing carb containing foods, go for those fiber rich foods as often as possible. So fiber rich foods differ significantly from what we call our refined grains. So refined grains are going to be foods like white bread, white rice, cakes and cookies. And we want to try to limit these foods as much as possible, not only because they really don't have a lot of nutritional value, meaning they don't provide a lot of protein, um, vitamins or minerals, but also because unlike dietary fiber, which is really not even digested and slows digestion of other carbs, refined grains are digested very, very quickly, which can cause our blood sugar levels to spike quite rapidly after consuming them, which can make it very challenging to control our blood glucose levels. So sugars are actually very similar to refined carbs and that sugars are going to be digested very, very quickly and they can cause these rapid rises in our blood sugar after consuming them. When we look on a nutrition facts label, we see both total sugars listed as well as added sugars listed. So added sugars, you can see here on the slide, a bunch of different food sources that are high in added sugars. We really want to try to limit our intake of foods that are high in added sugars because they, again, as we said, spike your blood glucose levels very, very rapidly because they're digested so quickly. But also like those refined grains, they don't provide much in terms of nutrition and nutrients. They don't provide a lot of protein or important and essential vitamins and minerals. So when we look at a nutrition facts label, we have total sugars and added sugars. The difference between these two are going to be our natural sugars. So if we look at the nutrition facts label on this, on this slide, you can see that total sugars are 12 grams, added sugars are zero grams. So this is for unsweetened applesauce. So we're actually getting all of our sugar in this unsweetened applesauce is of a natural source. So natural sugars do spike your blood sugar similarly to the way that refined grains do as well as added sugars. But we wanna encourage natural sugar sources in the diet because they provide a lot of other nutrients. So they're gonna provide a lot of our essential fatty acids, they'll provide important protein, 
many of our important vitamins for growth and development, as well as minerals. So no need to really limit those natural sugars sources, such as fruits and vegetables and dairy products. But we just want to be aware that they do have a tendency to spike those blood sugars a little bit. All right, so now that we've covered some kind of nutrition fundamentals, we are going to dive into two more what I'll call like advanced nutrition and type 1 diabetes topics. The first one being nutrition and exercise. So I'm sure as all of you know, there are many, many, many benefits for everyone for regularly participating in physical activity and exercise. But what's really nice is that there are actually some additional benefits for individuals with type 1 diabetes. Probably the most notable and important benefit to us is that regular exercise and regular physical activity can really help us better manage our blood sugar levels. And in fact, we can see these added benefits with managing our blood sugars up to 24 hours after completing our physical activity and exercise, which is fantastic, right? But actually trying to manage your blood sugars while you're exercising can certainly be quite tricky. And I'm sure many of you have experienced this. And the reason being is that different types and durations of exercise can impact our blood sugars very, very differently. So exercise known as aerobic exercise. So this is most often types of exercise that are going to be done at a lower intensity, but done for a longer duration. So this could be taking a jog in the park. It could be just walking around your neighborhood, biking, dancing. Again, lower intensity, but done for typically a longer period of time. These types of exercise tend to gradually drop our blood sugar with time. In contrast, anaerobic exercise. So this is going to be exercise like lifting weights. It's going to be sprinting, jump rope ring. These are done at a higher intensity, but for a most often a shorter duration of time. These types of exercise actually tend to cause spikes in our blood sugar, both during the physical activity itself, as well as for a short duration after. So you can see why managing your blood sugar during physical activity and exercise can be quite tricky to manage. So it's really important to remember to be patient. When you're first diagnosed with type one and trying to figure out how to manage your um, blood sugars while you're exercising, don't be discouraged. It can be at first, but remember, it's going to just take a lot of trial and error to figure out how do you personally respond to these different types of exercise as well as different durations of exercise? And then it's important to really personalize your diabetes management by working with your endocrinologist to adjust your insulin dosing potentially before, during, and after exercise and or adjust your carb intake. So lots of trial and error to figure out what is gonna work best for you. But across the board for everyone, it is absolutely critical to test your blood sugar or check your blood sugar before engaging in physical activity. If you test your blood sugar before engaging in physical activity and you are hyperglycemic, so if your blood sugar is over 250, it is really, really important to test for ketones in your urine before participating in physical activity. If ketones are present, you want to avoid those anaerobic forms of exercise. So really try to avoid those intense, vigorous activities if those ketones are present. You can still engage in kind of the lower intensity, moderate types of exercise because those are actually going to help drop your blood glucose levels, but be sure to avoid those high intensity types of exercise. If before you exercise, your blood sugar is less than 100 milligrams per deciliter, it is going to be important for you to consume around 15 grams of carbs if you're going to be exercising for less than 30 minutes. And if you're going to be exercising for more than 30 minutes, you may need to consume as much as 30 grams of carbs. And you want to eat this carbohydrate at least around 15 minutes before exercising. 
And the reason you want to give it that 15 minute period of time is because you want the body to start metabolizing and breaking down those carbohydrates. So it's starting to kick in to your blood sugar. So you don't become hypoglycemic during your exercise. If your blood sugar is in what we kind of call the sweet spot before exercise. So this is going to be between 100 and 150. This is kind of the ideal spot for exercise. You may need to consume about 15 grams of carbs right before you start exercising. But again, this is really where a lot of that trial and error will come in to see how your body reacts to exercise as well as keeping in mind the different types of exercise and the duration that you're going to be engaged in. All right, so we are going to wrap up by talking about a topic that is very, very popular in the field of nutrition right now. And actually, even before, while Danielle was presenting, I saw a lot of questions in the chat about low carb diets. And are they recommended? Are they safe for individuals with type 1 diabetes? It's a great question that so many people are asking right now. So if we think of a healthy dietary pattern, so what is recommended by those dietary guidelines for Americans? It is recommended in a healthy dietary pattern that about half of your total caloric intake come from carbohydrates. So to put that kind of in perspective, if an individual is consuming a 2000 calorie diet, this would mean that they're consuming about 250 grams of carbohydrate per day, just as a reference point. Now, if we compare that intake to our very popular, now carb-restricted diets. So our low-carb diet is typically recommends consumption between 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. Whereas our keto diets, also known as these very low carb diets, are typically providing less than 50 grams of carbs per day. So you can see a huge discrepancy between what is recommended by those dietary guidelines as a healthy dietary pattern and what is being recommended for carb intake on these carb restricted dietary patterns. So the big question that I know all of you are wondering is are carb restricted diets safe and healthy for individuals with type one diabetes? And I really wish I had a better answer for you, but we honestly don't know right now. So there are really no clinical guidelines at this time as to whether or not low carb diets, carb restricted diets are safe recommended and of low enough risk for individuals with type 1 diabetes. And the reason being is we really just don't have enough research and data right now that's either showing, yes, they're safe and they can actually produce positive, healthful outcomes among individuals with type 1. Or on the flip side, we don't have enough research showing that, no, they're not safe. They should not be followed. But that being said, we do know from kind of the early research that's been done that there are several precautions that individuals with type 1 diabetes really need to take if they're following a low carb, keto, carb restricted diet of any sort. So the first one really relates to the period known as the keto flu. And I'm sure many of you have heard of this kind of popular coin phrase of the keto flu. So the keto flu refers to typically the first month or so. It's a little bit shorter for some, a little bit longer for others. But it's the initial period of time in which an individual goes on a carb-restricted diet where they experience some very unpleasant, undesirable symptoms and side effects associated with a carb-restricted diet. So we often see lightheadedness, fatigue, constipation, dizziness in these individuals on carb-restricted diets. And what we've seen during this keto flu among individuals with type 1 is we see a lot of inconsistencies and variabilities with blood glucose levels. So we see a lot of spikes, a lot of hyperglycemic episodes during this keto flu period really due to stress hormones 
because the body is being placed under extreme stress when you're drastically cutting these carb, um, carb intake and stress hormones drive up our blood sugar levels. And then we also see a lot of episodes of hypoglycemia or those dips in blood glucose levels. And that those dips in blood glucose levels, those hypoglycemic episodes, really relates to the second point here is that being on a carb, um, a carb restricted diet really, really significantly increases risk for hypoglycemic episodes. So we talked about the fact that managing type one diabetes is all about balancing your insulin doses with your carbohydrate intake, right? And it's essential for people with type one diabetes to regularly take insulin for the human body just to function properly. But if we are basically drastically cutting, almost eliminating our carbohydrate intake, but we still need to take some insulin, what's very likely to happen? Those dips and those drops in blood glucose levels. So it can be very, very dangerous, especially early on when you're transitioning to a carb restricted diet to really try to balance your insulin dosing with such a low carbohydrate intake. And then the last point here is honestly the one, if you remember anything from this talk that I really want you to remember, because it is very, very important, is that carb-restricted diets are really inappropriate and potentially dangerous for individuals during periods of growth and development. So this can be children, it can be adolescents who are growing really, really rapidly, it can be for women who are pregnant as well as breastfeeding women. And the reason being is that carbohydrates are the human body's primary and preferred source of energy. The human body just runs and thrives on carbohydrates for fuel. We can use fat, we can use protein, but not as efficiently. So if we are drastically restricting carbohydrate intake, during these periods of rapid growth and development, it can actually significantly, or I should say it has potential to significantly impair growth and development because again, the human body is not getting that preferred source of energy. So it can really limit or impair the growth of that individual. So I would like to thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I am more than happy to take questions at this time. Thank you, Catherine. That was so helpful. Such great information. We do have um, several questions. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of run through the questions that have been submitted. I think we'll start with um, low carb, staying on that topic since, since you just finished um, that section. We have a question about a, a list of good low carb snacks for a 10 year old. Maybe in general, you could share some low carb snack ideas for children and adults. Yeah, absolutely. So low carb options, you really want to stick to, again, avoiding the whole grains group, but you can focus in on trying to still get good sources of protein in there are going to be really, really important. So most of your peanut butters, nuts, seeds can be really good options. Dairy most often needs to be avoided, but a good option, a good dairy option to get in good vitamins and nutrients, vitamin D, calcium, protein, um, would be cheese. So you can pair cheese with a low carb vegetable, such as you can have it with celery, you can have it with carrots, which tend to be on the lower carb side. Um, really trying to, again, though, not just focus on eliminating the carbs, but also paying a lot of attention to still getting healthful proteins in there, as well as healthful fats. So many people, when they are on a carb restricted diet, they're so over focused on eliminating the carbs that they forget the importance of those other key nutrients. Great advice. Thank you. Um, in terms of a carb intake for the day, you had shared some, some general stats around um, the, per, the amount of carbs for a 2000 calorie diet. Uh, we have a question about what would be a correct balance per day per meal? Do you have any guidelines that you could suggest? That's a really good question. Um, it's hard to say because the recommended carb intake all depends on your recommended caloric intake. So it's gonna vary for an individual on a 2000 calorie diet versus a 1200 calorie diet. I mean, some male adolescents or 
even females who are very physically active might be on a 3000, even a 4000 calorie diet in some situations. And it really is hard to give exact numbers because it's all really a matter of based on what is your caloric intake. But again, generally speaking, you should be consuming about half of, or the recommendation is to consume about half of your calories coming from carbs. Okay, great. Um, let's talk a little bit more maybe about carb counting and some label reading questions. Um, so some of these are a little bit specific. Um, if half of the dietary fiber amount deducted from the net carb count is above five grams, I guess the question is, how would you handle that? Yeah, great, great, great question. So we talked about the fact that dietary fiber does not affect your blood glucose levels. So what most dietitians and a lot of endocrinologists will recommend is if a food item contains five or more grams of carbohydrate per serving, you actually will want to subtract those five grams out of the total carbohydrate content of that food, that food item. So let's look at an example. So let's say a slice of bread contains 20 grams of carbohydrate and it contains, we'll just say five grams of dietary fiber. So what you would actually want to do, you're not really going to have 20 grams of carbohydrate affecting your blood glucose level, right? Because those five grams of dietary fiber aren't going to have an effect. So what you can do is take the 20 total grams of, of, diet, of carbohydrate and subtract out those five grams of dietary fiber, which would give you the 15 grams of net carbs, net carbs being the amount of carbohydrate that's actually gonna have an impact on your blood glucose level. So when you're figuring out your insulin bolusing, you would actually wanna use that 15 grams rather than the 20. But we don't bother to really subtract out dietary fiber unless a food item contains five or more grams of dietary fiber per serving. Otherwise, it's so minuscule and so minor, it's really not going to have a big impact. It's a great question. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, what about insoluble fiber? I recent, this person recently came across this on a food label and didn't know if it counted as carbs or not. Yeah, great question. Similar like aspect as just dietary fiber. Sometimes they break down the dietary fiber into soluble and insoluble, which honestly, no need to worry about the difference there. It's just kind of digested differently. It can have different impacts on the human body, but like it's umbrella term dietary fiber, it is not going to be digested. So again, more importantly than looking at the soluble versus the insoluble would just be looking at the total dietary fiber content. And if it's the five grams or above, then absolutely you can subtract that out from your total carb intake. But good for you for paying that much attention to the nutrition facts label and also for consuming fiber rich foods, that's great. Fortunately here in the US, that is an area that we struggle with a lot. So good for you. We have lots of questions on fiber, so that's good. Um, so this one is also a little specific. If you have two foods, one is high in fiber and the other isn't, but the total carbs are the same, does the calculation for insulin change? So you're, if we have two different foods, I just want to make sure I understand the question. Will we, will we calculate our insulin regimen differently based on that? Yeah. So again, I think that, that kind of alludes to the answer I gave previously, where if a food item contains five or more grams of dietary fiber per serving, we would want to subtract out that dietary fiber because again, it's not going to be having an impact on our blood glucose level. So in, in the comparison, I would assume, since you said it's high fiber, um, I would assume that you would actually be dosing your insulin differently because of that high fiber food would likely contain more than, or at least the five grams per serving. Okay. Um, let's switch and talk a little bit about exercise. We have some questions yeah. on that topic. What makes anaerobic exercises spike blood sugar? Yeah, great question, really great question. And it's important to remember, it doesn't do it for everyone and it doesn't do it for all types of anaerobic exercise. But generally speaking, it does happen for most. And the reason being is that during anaerobic exercise, we're actually, our human, our, the human body is in a state of stress because the, of that high intensity. So our body is secreting a lot of stress hormones. And as I mentioned with the ketogenic diet, 
those stress hormones actually cause our blood glucose levels to rise. So it is those stress hormones that are playing in there that are causing that blood sugar level to rise. And this is typically why we'll see those spikes during the exercise itself and then just for a short duration after, and then they'll start to come down because those stress hormones will cause the spike, but the stress hormones will dissipate shortly after the exercise is complete. So you will see a gradual trend down. Mm -hmm. We definitely see that with my teenage son when he's playing sports. Interesting. Yeah. Um, another question around exercise. You had talked about um, extra carbs 15 minutes before exercise. Do you bolus for those extra carbs? Great. Another really great question. So if you are not hyperglycemic, you absolutely, you no need to bolus for those extra carbs because honestly, they're really fueling that exercise. So we talked about if you're less than 100 milligrams per deciliter consuming 15 grams of carbs if you're doing less than 30 um, minutes of exercise and then probably around 25 to 30 grams of carbs if you're gonna be doing more than 30 minutes. But most often no need to actually bolus for those carbs because really the purpose of those carbs is to fuel the exercise since your blood glucose is already on the lower side. Perfect, thank you. Um, so switching gears a little bit, we have several questions from parents who have picky eaters. Can you yes. share some tips um, and maybe, you know, cover some different age groups? We have some toddler parents who are trying to introduce some new foods and then also um, lunches and snacks for elementary and high school students. Yeah, those are great questions. So actually, this is interesting you ask this because this is an area that I do research on. Um, and one of the best tricks, tricks I'll call it, to really help encourage better dietary intake among youth is to involve them in the kitchen. So engaging those kids, not only in cooking the food itself, but also the meal planning. So that has been shown to significantly increase the likelihood that the kids are going to eat the food that is being served. One caveat though, you don't wanna just give free reign, right? Because most kids are gonna pick chicken fingers, hot dogs, and mac and cheese every night. So you, you still need to have some level of control. Um, so what I always recommend doing is giving kids options. So you can say, okay, tonight we're having chicken breasts and brown rice. Can you pick the vegetable? Would you like carrots, peas, or green beans? Give them the choice, but do it within a defined limit. So kids, again, take ownership of that meal by getting to choose the food but you're still having some bit of control over the situation. And then really the more you can involve the kids, not only in menu planning, but also the food prep itself, you will, we've consistently seen really significant improvements in their intake. Um, and similarly, I would definitely do that with lunches, with snacks as well, trying to engage them as much as possible. And my recommendation for snacks is always try to include two food groups, kind of just as a general rule of thumb. So oftentimes, especially here in America, our snacks are all carbs. It's a very, very common, common ish issue that we see where kids are just eating a bag of Cheez-Its or they're eating goldfish crackers as their snack. Try pairing that carb source with, again, a yogurt or a cheese, something that can help honestly provide more nutrition, but also prevent the spikes in the carb intake by pairing it with a protein or fat source. That's great advice, thank you. I know the snacks can be challenging, especially um, at school when you're trying to pack healthy snacks, but also you know wanting to, to keep the, the kids fueled throughout the day. We have a couple of questions around um, gaining weight and losing weight. So um, this question is around needing help with gaining weight. So after being diagnosed, having lost some weight, any tips with what you could do to gain back some of that weight that was lost? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I will be honest with you, when you're first diagnosed, you've probably dropped a significant amount of weight, like you've mentioned, but just starting to get insulin on board and start, you'll start to get your appetite back and you will just honestly start to naturally gain weight because insulin is going to really, really, really help do that. Um, when you don't have insulin on board, you're actually going to be in, for lack of better terms, almost like 
peeing out, urinating out your caloric intake, which is why we often see ketones in the urine. So by just getting that insulin on board, get managing your blood glucose levels within your defined and recommended range. And I say within your defined and recommended range, because a lot of times it will differ. Your endocrinologist might give you a more, a broader, more liberal range when you're first diagnosed and then really tighten it up as you have more experience with the disease. But truthfully, I wouldn't stress or worry too, too much because that weight gain will just happen naturally once you start to get those blood, blood um, sugars under tighter control. But if you're still having trouble with gaining weight, what I do recommend is you could strive for consuming what we call like very nutrient dense foods. So these are gonna be foods that you don't have to eat huge portions of, but they're really packed with a lot of calories and a lot of nutrients. So these are things are gonna be like any of your nut butters. So it could be soy butter, peanut butter, um, nuts and seeds, your legumes are going to be really good sources where they're pretty densely concentrated nutrients, and they're going to give you basically a lot of bang for your buck. Great. Um, now, in terms of weight preventing weight gain, um, there's a question, is it important to keep insulin levels lower in order to prevent uh, fat or weight gain? So... No, <laughs> honestly, it's ideal to keep your insulin levels at, basically keep your insulin dosing at the level you need them to keep your blood sugar right in range. Um, that's always ideal. You don't, 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 don't want to try to manipulate your levels of your, how much insulin you're taking for weight loss or weight gain purposes. This is a very, very dangerous cycle that can happen. We actually see disordered eating and eating disorders very, very common among individuals with type one diabetes of all ages. And the reason being is that us with type one diabetes, we're taught from the day we're diagnosed to literally micromanage our dietary intake, right? It's not normal or natural for a 10 year old to have to count out how many pretzels they're eating. So just the way that we have nutritional recommendations for patients with type one diabetes, it almost encourages and fosters disordered eating behaviors. So we wanna be really, really careful and cautious of that. Um, and that being said, kind of man, trying to manipulate insulin dosing can lead to a lot of like disordered eating and eating disorders. So you don't wanna do that. Really the better way to lose weight is talk with your endocrinologist and your registered dietitian. Let them know that you are interested in losing weight and they'll help adjust your caloric intake and they can adjust your insulin dosing to match your new caloric intake. So you're not really adjusting the insulin to lose the weight. You're kind of doing it hand in hand with your dietary intake. So it's a really great question. Yeah, thank you. And I'm so glad that you mentioned disordered eating. Um, you mentioned having conversations with your registered dietitian as part of your healthcare visits. Could you maybe just talk a little bit more about that? There may be some folks joining us tonight who didn't know that that was an option as part of their healthcare team. Yeah, absolutely. You should definitely talk with your registered dietitian. Your endocrinologists are experts in diabetes. Um, they, they are also very knowledgeable in nutrition, but your Experts in the area of food and nutrition are certainly your registered dietitians, and they can be a huge benefit to you to really learn how you can better manage your type 1 diabetes on a day-to-day -day basis in special circumstances like exercise, weight management, um, whether it's loss or gains. And almost every single endo um, endocrinology clinic should either have a registered dietitian on staff or at least readily accessible that you could reach out to that have expertise in type one diabetes because it is a very different disease than type two diabetes or other types of um, chronic diseases that people face. So I definitely encourage you to reach out to your registered dietitian because they can be a really helpful resource. Great, wonderful. Um, if you are having a low, should you still eat the meal you were planning to eat or should you treat the low and eat your meal and take insulin? Or do you eat and not take insulin? I know this can be, a, this is a, a question that comes up a lot and, and can be complicated to figure out in the moment. It is really hard. And it 
it depends a lot on the individual, the situation, honestly, the meal you're going to be having. Um, but when you're low, you probably feel like you can eat everything in sight, right? You can eat the kitchen sink, literally, because you are so hungry and so ravenous for food. And it's hard not to, to actually do that, end up eating the whole entire bag of pretzels. So what you can do is what, or I should say at least what I always recommend to do is treat the low and then consume your meal. But when you're treating that low, be sure to allow enough time to allow your blood sugar to come up, reach kind of the recommended range, even if it's on the lower end. So even if you're still in the seventies, mid seventies, um, even the low seventies. So you might be treating it not as aggressively as you would often do, but what this can actually do is it can prevent overeating at, of the meal itself. So a lot of times if you're having a low blood sugar and you sit down to your dinner, you are just going to inhale that dinner and you're going to take seconds and you're going to want to take thirds because you are so ravenous because you're experiencing that low blood sugar. So my recommendation is always treat the low, maybe not to the fullest extent that you normally would. So if you're normally recommended to consume 15 grams of carbs, wait the 15 minutes for that blood sugar to come up. Maybe just treat it with like eight grams of carbs to have less juice. Let your blood sugar come up to maybe the seventies and then you can start consuming that meal to really honestly help with portion control during the meal. Okay, great. Um, we have some questions around celiac. Can you share any food recommendations um, for a dual diagnosis of celiac and T1D? Yeah, that is a really great question. It's a challenging area. Um, so with celiac disease, you have to really avoid the consumption of gluten. But as we said, carbohydrates are still really important to the diet. So my recommendation with celiac disease is really, really lean heavily on those legumes. So lean heavily on the beans. People here in the US really under consume beans. They are a unsung hero because they are so nutritionally packed. They are inexpensive. They're a great energy source. Um, so I would say really, really, really rely on those heavily. There's also so many different commercially available gluten-free products now. So there's breads, there's flours that are still an option. Um, the other option can always be relying on your carb containing vegetables. Mm -hmm. So leaning on your potatoes, whether these are white potatoes or sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes are a great option. Very, very, very healthy. Um, relying on peas and corn. So you're still getting those carbs in, fueling your body, getting in that energy, but avoiding the gluten. And those would be at a lower cost because sometimes those gluten-free products can be quite expensive. Right. Good point. Um, okay, our last question before we wrap up, there's been um, several questions around what do you do when you're out at a restaurant? How do you calculate carbs when you don't have a food label in front of you? Um, any tips for apps to use or sort of some best practices? Yeah, that's a great question. So thankfully, a lot of restaurants are now posting their nutrition facts information online. So that's a great resource to use, brother, before you go to the restaurant look up whether it's Applebee's or wherever it might be that you're heading. So many restaurants have it available. So first check the website for that restaurant. Um, the second thing I will say is be careful, very, very careful with using a lot of the apps um, out there. My Fitness Pal, Fit, um, Nutritionist Pro, there's a bunch of those out there. The accuracy in those can be very poor. So be really, really careful with using those apps. I know they're really user-friendly because you can search and find almost any and every product out there by brand, but most often it is just everyday coming people that are entering those items in. It's not done by professionals. It's not done by registered dietitians or clinicians. So there's a lot of errors in their accuracy. Um, if you are in a pump, most pumps, I have mine right here, most pumps have a food database in them, which can be really, really helpful if you can't exactly pick your Applebee's hamburger that you're gonna have. Look at and identify the carb containing items in that food and you're just gonna have to break down that, that food item, which can be tricky and challenging, but honestly, that's typically the best route to go. And my other recommendation is always use kind of those basic carb counting tools that you've 
hopefully learned from your endocrinologist and dietitian with using common objects to kind of estimate portion size. So looking at like your fist being about a cup. So if you have a pile of mashed potatoes, literally put your fist next to that to help you estimate the portion size. There's a lot of other common object portion size comparisons. If you just Google that, um, they can be really, really helpful to know, okay, meat should be about the size of the palm of your hand. It can be so helpful when you're in those tough situations at a restaurant trying to figure out exactly what your carb intake is. I wish there was an easier answer, but unfortunately there's not. No, those are very helpful, practical tips. Thank you. Um, and Catherine, thank you. You covered a lot of ground tonight. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your expertise with us. My family has been um, at this for almost 10 years and I learned along with everyone tonight as well. So um, thank you for My pleasure. taking the time tonight. Danielle, thank you for sharing your family story with all of us. It's always inspiring to hear from our outreach volunteers. And we're really grateful for the time you spend welcoming newly diagnosed parents and individuals to the JDRF family. For those of you who may be interested in a personal connection with a JDRF outreach volunteer, you can submit a request online at jdrf.org. Danielle mentioned that earlier, and we did post a link in the chat. So please feel free to check that out. And finally, thanks so much to all of you for joining us tonight. We encourage you to connect with your local JDRF chapter to learn more about the programs and activities that are happening in your community. If you aren't yet connected to a chapter, you can find your nearest chapter on jdrf.org and we will post a link in the chat as well. Um, I mentioned that these no limit sessions are quarterly. Our next session will be hosted the first week of November. So you can expect to receive more information next month. I did see a question earlier wondering if the slide deck was going to be available. We will send out a recording of the event. Um, so you'll receive that likely on Monday via email, along with a brief survey. We'd love to hear your feedback um, on tonight's session and other topics that you'd like to hear about in the series. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening.